I'm uh, a political science guy who does uh, policy work, so uh, my approach to this is, is different. And I just want to give as, a, as an overview a couple of things. Uh, one is that the modeling analysis that was presented before the break suggests enormous potential for carbon mitigation in the forests at costs that are cost effective. But that is based on an assumption that uh, that's feasible. Uh, and that's somehow the, you know, the policies and practices need to change dramatically in a way that, that's feasible, uh, credible, and legitimate. And we, we haven't done that sort of analysis yet. We're uh, really just uh, beginning that. And uh, I also want to know, you know it, I've been studying forest policy for, in British Columbia for a couple of decades now, and one of the things that we talk about is the relationship between broad public values and public policies and the way we manage our forests. And uh, values in society change. In the 1970s and 80s, we had a huge shift in British Columbia away from values about uh, production only to ones that took into account environmental values more seriously. We're now experiencing another fundamental change, and that's towards the relative importance of carbon and climate issues uh, in the forest um, as part of that broader environmental envelope. Policies frequently lag behind those changes of values, and, and we're at that stage now where policies are lagging significantly behind, and hopefully they'll be, uh, with the exciting uh, new governance situation that we have, an opportunity to, uh, to dramatically ramp up uh, a, a convergence between where we're at in terms of our value set and where our forest and climate policies are. We really do face uh, some quite different kinds of choices about how to approach this policy-wise. We could continue to do what we're doing with some elaboration by relying on um, uh, forest carbon offsets. Uh, that, that's the one at the bottom there. We could go out and spend money and invest it directly, take public money and invest it in the forest. Uh, or we could uh, change policies uh, to require uh, or incent these sorts of uh, greenhouse gas reductions. And I'll give the examples uh, of each of those. And starting with the offsets, because that's really our contemporary framework, and what we do with each of these is we go through what the current status is, uh, whether there's some kind of a gap there, and if so, uh, what uh, option exists to, to see if that could be filled. We have this requirement for carbon neutral government in our province that has provided a regular market for forest carbon offsets, but it's quite a, a small one. Uh, the new regulations have been put in place to provide for uh, the LNG industry, GERCA, it's, it's too long a, uh, an acronym for anybody, uh, but it would uh, basically provide a significantly larger market for offsets if there's an LNG industry that emerges in the province. Uh, and if the way they choose to get their greenhouse gas reductions is to in invest in uh, other people's projects as opposed to doing it within their own site. Uh, we'll see uh, if either of those things happen. So even if that does happen, though, there's still a, a limit on the size of the offset market. And one option that the province has is it could partner with other jurisdictions in Canada or North America or globally uh, to be part of a larger cap and trade and offset system where uh, we could have a much larger uh, um, market for offsets. The accounting for forest carbon is uh, remarkably complex. And uh, in British Columbia, we have gotten very good, or relatively good, at measuring carbon flows uh, through the forest and through uh, wood products, and we display those publicly. But in terms of our actual accounting, what we count towards our legal obligations to reduce emissions, we only count a very small fraction of the measured uh, anthropogenic forest emissions. And one of the things that we could do, if we wanted to, is we could change that. We could change it to move more into accordance with international uh, accounting norms so that we uh, count that stuff as part of reductions towards targets. And that would create an incentive for all actors in the uh, system, government, uh, industry, and others, to uh, create policies and practices that bring us more uh, into line with our uh, legal reduction targets. So that's one kind of instrument, you know, how we choose to account for things. We're famous for our carbon tax, a, a fiscal instrument, uh, currently capped at $30 a ton. We all kind of know that's going to go up, again, especially with our exciting new government arrangements. I shouldn't say exciting. I don't want to. It is exciting because it's exciting because it's so new and different and unconventional. But we're $30 a ton. Uh, it does not cover forest emissions. It covers fossil fuel emissions from logging trucks, but it doesn't cover emissions that come from uh, all the sorts of things that uh, you heard about before the, um, uh, the break. 
it would be very complicated to figure out how to apply that across the board, but a, a more a modest thing you could do is uh, the stubborn uh, challenge of slash burning in the province. We could tax the emissions from those and uh, potentially create a significant disincentive for something that has been a, a significant challenge uh, for the province for quite some time. So those are a couple of, uh, uh, it's a fiscal instrument. Another uh, core to our, our forest policy framework is, is tenure, the way we allocate the rights to uh, crown forest. And in exchange for allocating the rights to harvest timber, we expect obligations from uh, licensees, among them uh, a sustainable yield, protecting various environmental values. We don't uh, provide for any carbon either obligations or incentives at the moment. And uh, our tenures could be changed to authorize uh, licensees to uh, uh, manage for carbon and they could figure out what to do with those benefits they get out of doing so. Uh, that would be another big change. Uh, one way in which we have done that is in uh, several areas in the province we have created uh, organization specific tenure arrangements called atmospheric benefit agreements. Three of them with First Nations and then with a, a small uh, community forest up uh, near Whistler. Uh, the tra challenge is that thus far those only uh, um, represent a very small fraction of the province and we could choose to expand those dramatically. We could essentially create a relationship with every First Nation or every community forest or every licensee where you had this sort of uh, mechanism for sharing carbon benefits between uh, the Crown uh, and whoever that non-Crown actor was. Another fundamental mechanism we have, and arguably the single most important way that we regulate four values in the forest, is uh, the core uh, um, statute of the Forest Range and Practices Act. It is designed to uh, require licensees to protect for 11 different values in the forest, from recreation to watershed values, scenic values, et cetera. When it was written, carbon was not part of that construction of how we thought about forest values and it was not included. But we could add it. We could add it uh, uh, through a simple legislative amendment and it would be transformative in terms of the requirements on licensees to manage for carbon. And it would have a subsidiary effect where if you change the rules through FERPA, you would also be changing the way that we would be calculating the allowable annual cut to greater consider uh, carbon mitigation values uh, in the forest. Uh, fire management, a huge issue. Uh, obviously for the province, the Wildfire Act requires that we manage forest risks uh, and this leads to this common practice of slash burning. We could shift uh, the way we do that management to encourage or require greater consideration of uh, carbon and forest management, uh, in fire management, sorry, it would be a very challenging thing uh, to do so. In terms of the harvested wood products, we do have mechanisms designed to encourage uh, wood use, but they're relatively soft and gentle. We have a Wood First Act, which gives uh, a general uh, soft invitation to people building um, buildings with uh, government funds that they should consider wood first, as long as it's consistent with codes uh, and other values. It has probably led to an increase in the use of wood products, but uh, taking that next step of being a little bit more directive, for example, requiring through codes that all buildings be built with wood, unless there's a really good reason not to, is not something that we have really uh, uh, stepped forward to, to think much about. But if you want to get serious about wood use in buildings, uh, you could take a more uh, directive approach. Bioenergy, uh, another major issue, and that shows up as a huge uh, thing in the mitigation scenarios. Uh, we could, uh, we currently have modest policies to encourage a wood bioenergy use, including a couple of secondary uh, tenures, uh, but there is little direction provided in policy uh, about the specific use of bioenergy, and we could, if we want to, provide for financial incentives or regulatory requirements for uh, bioenergy use where it, it is a, a net contribution to uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. And finally, uh, we could directly use uh, funding from government to uh, invest in the forest to have it uh, mitigate more carbon. Uh, the Forest Carbon Initiative was announced as part of the Climate Leadership Plan back in the summer. More recently, the uh, Premier announced $115 million to the uh, Forest Enhancement Society in BC to help begin rehabilitating the forest in part uh, for this purpose of uh, greenhouse gas mitigation. Uh, but there's not currently an operational plan that's been made public or a funding plan that's been made public that actually 
uh, shows a way that the province could use that sort of strategy to meet the 12 million ton uh, uh, objective that it set for that in the uh, climate leadership plan. Uh, so we could uh, uh, fill that gap by uh, developing uh, that operational and, and, and funding plan more rigorously. And just to conclude, uh, really, uh, where we do are faced with a situation where our value shift towards greater concern to carbon has not yet been reflected in policy. So our climate policies have only modest coverage of forests, and our forest policies uh, generally uh, ignore carbon. Uh, we could change both of those things uh, if we um, uh, choose to uh, move in that direction. Uh, for this part of the project, the next step is to gather more stakeholder input on what the options and uh, issues are here and then do a more elaborate policy analysis where we'll take a series of structured options and look at a uh, set of criteria such as uh, uh, mitigation effectiveness, cost effectiveness, and administrative and political feasibility. Okay, so that's uh, my contribution for now.